we can no longer kind of rely on things just getting better. Sort of every two or three years, we'll get another 50 cents with 2x energy efficiency, whatever the, the scaling is. That's kind of really slowing down. And so the specialization of the processes is being driven by that. So we need an architecture that is more memory. And, it, and if you go back to the kind of fundamental processor, we don't move data very far. So the whole architecture is geared around data staying local to the process. And, and the physics of moving data is one of the things that really drive power. So there's, there's kind of doing the actual operations, so driving the, the computation. And, and then there's moving data to and from your memory subsystem. So if your memory is very close, the cost of moving data there is a lot lower energy cost compared to if, like, if you got chip, the, um, the cost is a lot higher. And, and this kind of goes into the power of the consumption of the device. Where are you spending your power? You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show about machine learning in the real world. And I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. Phil Brown leads GraphCore's applications team, building high performance machine learning applications for their intelligence processing units or IPUs. Phil's background is in computational chemistry, which is maybe one of the topics I really wish I knew more about. And what he works on now is hardware for machine learning, which is the other topic that I really wish I knew more about. So I always say this, but I could not be more excited to talk to him today. I really want to talk about GraphCore and kind of what it does broadly and what you're doing there. But I thought it might be fun to start off with, I was looking at your background and I saw that you were mm -hmm originally trained as a computational chemist and then was working at uh, Cray. And we've actually noticed that Weights and Biases, a whole bunch of computational chemists using our, our software, which has been intriguing. I, I kind of wanted to hear your career path and how you um, ended up at GraphCore. Uh, yeah, certainly. So it's been a, it's been a bit of an, an interesting journey. And I, and I, I mean, I'm, I'd be interested to know what they were doing, whether they, I mean, I guess running sets of molecular da dynamics or, or sort of quantum chemistry kind of calculations. It seems like there's a lot of kind of drug discovery and some material science. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty much what I used to do a long time ago. So running sort of computational simulations of various different states. The way I ended up in sort of machine learning space was kind of via the high performance computing arena. And actually my PhD was writing computational chemistry code. So quantum chemistry, density functional theory in, embedded inside a molecular dynamic simulation and, and actually looking to try and accelerate the density functional theory, the, the quantum chem um, chemistry bit of that using very early accelerators. So actually I was did a PhD at, at the University of Bristol and there was a company in Bristol called ClearSpeed that were building an early numerical accelerator. I think before we had GPGPUs, before that kind of period, or right when the first GPUs were coming out, about the same time the cell processor came out, if there are any other people who were playing around, so PS1, that kind of era. And this, this company was trying to build double precision, so sort of HPC accelerator. And so I was actually writing, trying to use those for, for these kind of computational chemistry simulations, so about 2000. Um, five, six, seven kind of time frame. So, and and actually, as it happens, my boss today is somebody who worked at ClearSpeed and and was building those kind of things. And a number of the, particularly the software team at GraphCore, have kind of heritage going back to that. There, there's a bit of a kind of a Bristol group of hardware and software engineers who have done various kinds of things over over the years. So, so that was kind of, and that was really what got me in um, from being a chemist. I am not a computer scientist in any sense. I kind of dabble a little bit, but I'm not a kind of a software developer or a computer scientist. And that, that took me from a, from a pure kind of chemist into the HPC and the kind of computational science domain of, of high performance computing and, and building systems. And, and then I, I spent a bit of a uh, couple of years in, in a consultancy that was specializing in helping people buy these systems actually. And, and then went to Cray and, and, and was helping sort of design and build these systems. And actually I, I did a variety of different things to spend a couple of years focusing actually on weather forecasting. So the, the numerical science and how you build large production systems for weather forecasting. And, and, and particularly in the US, NOAA and, and the National Weather Service here in the UK, they, the Met Office and, and actually around the world. At that time, Cray were building systems for 80% of the large weather centers. So the kind of the National Weather Centers and those kind of things. So, um, so that, was, that was kind of great fun. But I, as kind of the machine learning domain started taking off, I was kind of quite interested in, in that as a field. It was clear actually that supercomputing, the high end, w wasn't going to continue growing at such an interesting rate. And there happened to be this kind of little company in, in Bristol called GraphCore that, that had a, a really interesting technology, was just sort of starting to 
um, to make some waves. And so I, I sort of got in touch with, with Matt actually and, and a few other people and ended up sort of coming to join Graph Corey, um, actually working as, as part of the leading the field engineering group, so customer facing and technical teams were actually working directly with our customers to build applications. Um, Could you talk a little bit about, I've always been fascinated by this, about how weather prediction works. So weather prediction is is an interesting field. Sort of fundamentally, it's actually quite simple. The the atmosphere is a is a set of sort of fluids interacting, and so you can describe that with a set of equations, and and you can just kind of solve using those equations. And so in some senses, it's just a giant fluid dynamics simulation, but it's also a bit more complicated than that because you have particles, you've got lots of interesting sort of surface effects. Um, you've got the Coriolis effect where the, the Earth is actually rotating. You've also got quite an interesting initialization problem in that space because you don't, uh, I mean, climate simulations are much longer duration. Weather forecasting simulations are typically, I mean, you might only care about the next 10 hours, 12 hours, two weeks. But so your initialization is actually critical. So so actually the data assimilation where they take the sort of the global set of satellite observations and and, and other kinds of weather observations and integrate those into the model as the starting position is, is a really critically important part of that. So so there's lots of lots of quite hairy maths and lots of big computers to try and and scale these systems. The other thing that's quite close to machine learning or certainly common is, is this, this idea of sort of time to train, time to get to a solution is quite important. If you're running a big simulation, then actually, if, if you're gonna have to wait three weeks for it, it's pointless actually running it. You, you need, your experimental cycle has to be manageable. And, and in weather forecasting, a weather forecast is, has to be, you want to be able to predict two weeks in two hours or something like that. Right. So, so actually being able to, to meet that kind of operational deadline for delivery uh, and was quite important. For, how for does the delivery. physics, like the, the kind of physics simulations compare to like a more sort of machine learning approach where you make less assumptions about the underlying um, physics and just try to treat it as a standard prediction problem? In NWP and in most of the computational sciences in general, you're, you're building a kind of a simulation based on some set of physics or chemistry or uh, material science or whatever, particular disciplinary in biology, there will be some set of, of fundamental principles that you are modeling in your system. And so it, it, it's very much a science-based, sort of first principles-based approach to solving these problems. I mean, they, they typically do have approximations in them. And so actually there's there's a num quite a bit of interest, I think, in the particularly in the climate field, but also in, also in the weather field of replacing some of their parameterizations of systems where the physics is too expensive to run. So the particle interactions are too expensive to model directly at large scale. And so up till now, they have used approximations for that, actually trying to replace their, their basic approximations with um, machine learning models that will be cheaper or more accurate or both. And so so there is that, that kind of interaction where with everything, the entire world, you could technically simulate everything right down to the lowest kind of quantum dynamical sort of quantum interaction state uh, level, but that would be phenomenally expensive. You wouldn't necessarily want to do that. So, also, you can't um, observe it, right? I mean, it's, I would think the ob observations would be messy. Well, so, so I mean, if, you, if you're going right down to sort of an individual electron, yes, you, you wouldn't be able to observe that state, but you could, um, the, the sort of quantum interactions, the, the way that the difference between sort of the biology and the, and the chemistry or the molecular dynamical sphere and the, and the quantum um, mechanics sphere is that that where you've got the sort of binding energies where you're actually making and breaking bonds, though those are the, sort of the quantum mechanical effects starting to come in as you're making those bonds. And so you can accurately sort of simulate those things. It's just you can't observe the individual particles at that level. So the simulation of the kind of binding energy is still possible at, at that level. But but I mean that's phenomenally expensive. I mean you can't at the time I was doing it, it was difficult to model um sort of water and maybe sort of small groups of water. Um, where you've got the, the hydrogen bonds, that was getting a little bit expensive. I suspect a decade on, we're probably a bit further than that now, but it's still, you won't be able to monitor. Well, they might just about be able to do, say, the, a full protein or something like that. But it's also a question of, is it meaningful to, to actually, you don't need that level of, of fidelity or you don't need that level of, of, of modeling. Where do you want to spend your compute time? In these systems? So, um, or even your observation time. When I'm imagining the modeling the weather on the planet Earth, I'm sure you can't get very fine grained at all, right? From observing the state of, of Earth, right? Well, that used to be the challenge. 
I mean, it very much used to be the challenge. It, it's a lot better now that they've got satellites that, that give them sort of complete world coverage. I mean, the, the challenge before that was that, that you didn't have observations. Um, actually, the, the Met Office do a great, or they have an interesting set of observations and an analysis of, of around D-Day when in 1944, uh, when we the invasion of Europe, the prediction of that weather window when they actually launched the invasion, the Germans did not think that there was going to be a weather window. Their, their analysis of the weather, because they didn't have observations in the North Atlantic, but they had much, much faster observations in the North Atlantic. And so but at that point in time, there was a real lack of observational information. I think that's been closed. I mean, satellites today give you kind of full globe coverage for a lot of things. They maybe don't give you the sort of vertical profile in the atmosphere that you might want in some places, but um, they also sort of have observations from aircraft and a range of other things as well. Did the, so this is kind of a naive question, I guess, but when I look online or go into dark sky or something and, you know, get the seven day forecast, are those like meaningfully improving over my lifetime? Yes. Yes. I mean, it depends if you're looking at these things emotively or, or if you look at the analysis. Yes, they're, they're measurably getting better. Wait, what does um, it mean to look at it emotively? I just, just this sort of well, feeling that's I, so, wrong. So people, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. It, it, it's a, we're British. The, we're always complaining about the weather and we're always complaining about the way, <laughs> the predictability of the weather here. But it's raining here at the moment. But the improvement in these kind of forecasts are incremental. But, but I mean, over a decade, the the ability sort of the accuracy of a forecast out a day has improved quite significantly this is probably location dependent but at what point can you does like forecasting out based on sort of the physics of what's going on stop being meaningfully better than forecasting based on climate or or just sort of like what's the sort of average state of weather like can you predict out like three weeks and and have like a meaningful gain with a a physics-based model so the numerical systems and this is getting to the edge of my knowledge now the i think the numerical systems are are good out to two weeks so the kind of the long range forecasts are typically out to the kind of two to three week window and then they're now starting to do sort of seasonal sort of the bridging the gap between climate which is sort of multi-year and and sort of decadal and and the short term NWP. They're starting to do seasonal predictions and, and they are showing skill, i.e. prediction above a random, prediction above the sort of the climatology, the if you just look at history and base it on, on the average of history. So they're starting to show skill beyond that and, and things like El Nino prediction and this kind of thing. They are starting to show skill out in that kind of term. But it, it, it's a it's very much a kind of the, the mean. Are we going to have a, a wet summer or a dry summer? The, the challenge, I think, for, for those kind of organizations when they're articulating that is so the Met Office had a wonderful thing where they said it was going to be a barbecue summer and all, all the, the headlines were barbecue summer that, that was picked up by the press. And what they what actually turned out was it was a bit warmer and a bit wetter, but a little bit warmer, a little bit wetter. And and so people's kind of perceptions of, of what barbecue summer means, that means um, it's going to be nice and dry the entire time. And that, that's not necessarily <laughs> what the prediction saying it's going to be slightly warmer than average and it's going to be slightly wetter than average really translates to for somebody's experience. So that's the kind of thing, the challenge with a lot of the interpreting the information can be quite challenging, but making it, it, it sort of generally understandable. Can be quite challenging. Sorry, we should talk about chips, but I have one more we, question. We should, I can't, yes, I can't help myself. Stop. One last question. <laughs> what, what, is the, what is the function that you're trying to optimize when you predict weather? Ooh. Well, so, so they're not trying to optimize. Or how do you measure success, kind of... I guess? Okay, that, so yeah, that's a better. Um, so they have a, a, a very wide range of metrics. So they're, they're looking at, at sort of sea surface temperature. The, I mean, you're comparing the state of the atmosphere that you predict against the state of the atmosphere that actually exists. So you'll have a set of observations. And so the temperatures, the atmospheric pressures, the amount of precipitation. There's a huge range of skill scores that, that mm. these organizations generate. I mean, if you're really, if you're interested in this, ECMWF, which is the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, has quite a detailed set of kind of, if you go and dig into their webpage, quite a detailed set of analysis on, on their, their forecasts. And as they're producing new forecasts, they're, they're producing analyses of where is it improving and where where is it sort of degrading relative to what they had before? And ideally, you want all of the numbers to be green. And so they're, they're doing quite a lot of work there. And, and you can actually see the evolutions. And 
I mean, going back to kind of computing, you can actually see the evolutions in computers there as well, because they, they step up the resolutions as they're getting better systems, as they, as they work as a software um, team to develop their software, that they're, they're delivering higher resolution forecasts, which tends to translate to better accuracy in the models. Cool. Um, well, thanks for the digression. That that was fun. And if anyone's listening or watching this and, and knows more about this, let us know. I'd love to. Uh, yeah, I mean, more. I will have to admit my my knowledge is is very much it's probably five years old, and <laughs> and even at that point, I was not an expert in this space. So I I will apologize if I've got anything massively wrong. Please <laughs> please correct me. Well, so okay. So I guess you you sort of mentioned that you felt like high performance computing like wasn't growing as fast as what Graphcore is doing. I guess what what is the difference between kind of high performance computing and graph core? Like why why isn't it sort of the same kind of problem with the same kind of hardware solution? Well, so so I would say that And I should say I don't um, really know what high performance computing is. So I think I need some definitions here to even understand the the point. Sort of high performance computing in the sense of numerical simulation where you you're using a set of physics or chemistry to um, to 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 create a model of a system and, and generate some kind of prediction of, of behavior that that's or, or uh, generate some kind of output and, and typically um, those systems are um, relatively input light so you'll be inputting a small amount of information a model of a or the structure of a protein that you want to have an, an ligand that you've got an interaction with or a description of a furnace or something like that and, and a flame and you want to understand how that system behaves and so you actually generate huge amounts of information out of those kind of systems so, and, and there's a huge space and it's been going for many decades and, and has in the, in the past 20 or 30 years and sort of been growing moderately fast. The, the machine learning space is really geared around taking very large amounts of data, very large amounts of data, and, and using that to, to kind of build rather than apply a set of, of, of rules to that data. You're using the data itself to kind of build the model system. And, and to learn the rules itself. So it's a learning system rather than a system that you're you're designing to solve a problem. I think that's probably the easiest at a high level. But then I guess, what does that translate to? So I can kind of see how those are different, but I'm sort of imagining, oh, there's probably a bunch of, you know, bunch of linear algebra underneath both of those problems. Like why do you need different types of hardware to, to solve them well? So well, I, I, so the the differences from a, from a kind of a, a computational science perspective are, um, the, the generally the HPC kind of simulations require quite high precision, and there is a bit of debate in that community about whether you really need 64-bit everywhere, whether you should really be doing 32-bit in some places. But but generally, you need quite high precision for most of that field, and 90% of it, I'm guessing today, is probably done in double precision. What we with machine learning you're trying to sort of learn from a very large volume of data and, and make actually a relatively sort of limited set of, of kind of predictions out of it. But it's the learning process. And, and what's become very clear is that you don't need high precision when you're in this kind of learning process. So, I mean, NVIDIA started out, um, or the, the people when they were leveraging the NVIDIA GPUs, started out using single precision. The GPUs were good at single precision and it was much faster than double precision. Um, and then people discover, well, you don't actually need single precision. You can do it in half precision. And so somebody built some hardware that was better at half precision. And, and so they started leveraging sort of 16-bit. And people, when they're doing inference, they're using 8-bit int and 4-bit int. And they're looking and people are even playing around with binary kind of formats. So it's very clear that this, this domain has, from a computational perspective, at that level, a very, very different character from a, from a numerical precision perspective, different requirements. Um, and then the other thing that, that's kind of quite clear and actually quite interesting about this space is that, so today we treat everything that we work with or almost everything that we work with as dense linear algebra. So if you look at a classic CNN model like a, a ResNet, um, that, those, that, that convolutional network is typically translated for when you're actually doing the maths with it on the computer into some kind of dense structure that you're working with, even though that convolution could be looked at as, as a relatively sparsely connected pattern. And, and if you look at transformers and, and these kinds of systems that we're, we're using and have, have seem to be eating the world in, in natural language processing, um, they are big map models, big dense matrix objects. But what we also know is that if we train a model at the end, we can then prune it quite aggressively and not lose very much fidelity, particularly if you go through a few training cycles afterwards as well. 
and there have been a number of papers on um, rigging the lottery and, and a number of other ones um, that are sort of theorizing that actually what we're looking for, the systems we're interested in are actually fundamentally sparse. Um, so we want to be able to train the sparse systems. We think if we could train these systems in a sparse way, it would we'd save a huge amount of flops. If we only had 10% or 1% um, of the parameters in the system, we wouldn't be calculating all of these other numbers. And so it has a real interest in these systems in, in actually being able to do sparse algebra efficiently and not just for inference, but for training as well. And we also are in a place where OpenAI and, and some of the very large organizations in this space, or organizations with access to very significant compute power, are building huge models. It'd be really nice to not have to quite go as far as that. And so if, if I didn't have to build a 5 trillion parameter model, and I only had to build a 500 million parameter model, that would save me a lot of compute. It would, it would sort of reduce the kind of the cost of, of doing, of using that model. It would reduce the cost of training that model. I might still have to train it over a very big data set, but it would make it a lot cheaper to do iterations as possible. So that's the other thing I think that fundamentally differentiates the, the, the machine learning space and, and the problems that we're trying to solve. And, and that's not to say there aren't sparse problems in, in, in XPT. There definitely are. But that combination of sparse and, and low precision, and, and particularly the sparse bit is not something we've tackled. Um, well, the sparse bit is the not other something that... that's like uh, really supported, right? In, in in general practice, right? I mean, is there ways to take advantage of that that sparseness now with existing hardware to train faster? So today, or or as of not 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 really, and and so this is one of these kind of chicken and egg problems where somebody needs to go and build some hardware that allows you to solve these kind of problems, and then they also but but. Nobody builds the hardware until the problem's there that really justifies it. And so we are starting to see these kind of things evolve. And so actually one of the things that, that I'm really excited about with our our next um, software release is that we are, we're including both um, static sparse libraries, the ability to work with static sparsity. So you know the sparsity pattern up front. This might be the attention matrix in a system, or it might be a, a mask or something like that. You, you can typically know some of these things up front, as well as dynamic sparsity, where you don't know. So you can have a change and, and we can deliver this with actually very, very significant performance on, on our architecture. That's one of the things about the IPU is it, it was specifically designed to be a very fine grained um, processing system and to be able to target these problems as well as being fast and good at the dense stuff as well. And so it kind of gives you a, and this is the thing, you can build sparse computing systems, but they typically go so much slower than the dense computing systems that actually just running sort of sparse on the dense system, so filling it full of zeros makes more sense. So, well, it's funny. I was uh, going to mention that. I, I mean, I am like decades out of date on this, but I remember doing a little bit of work on this in grad school and, and being surprised that, I mean, it's, I, I would predict, I guess, based on my incredibly old <laughs> experience that a sparsity factor of like 1%, you might as well just fill in all the zeros like you were saying and um, not even worry so, about the sparseness. Well, yeah, and this is... I mean, going back to kind of the HPC space, this is people never use the sparse solvers in the HPC space because they're so slow or, or, or the sparse linear algebra, but, uh, unless they've got a like a 99.9% .9 sparse problem, in which case they start making sense. So the some of the interesting things about the characteristics we have in, in machine learning is is that they aren't that sparse, actually. So they're, they're dense enough so that doing the kind of the pure sparse arithmetic doesn't necessarily make sense. But um, we also believe that some of our structures are big enough that you can get away with having sort of small dense blocks within them. And so the thing that's really difficult with 100% with sparse systems is, the, well, there, there are a couple of things that are difficult. The access patterns moving around a lot is something that's quite difficult to handle. But from a like a really low level computational perspective, the way we get efficiency on, on all of these computer architectures is by having kind of dense block structures that we work with, and particularly two-dimensional functional units. And so if you want to keep those busy, you need sort of a block of work that's about the same kind of size as those units. And so for us, those are quite small. They, they might be 16 by 16. And so actually in, in big structures, the accuracy degradation you get over a pure sparse system going to a one of these kind of um, small block sparse systems isn't too much. I mean, th this is, and I, and I say that there's been a very limited amount of work on this because the hardware just hasn't existed. But the, the indications are that there looks like there's a really nice compromise where you can get really great performance 
with a relatively and whilst whilst leveraging this kind of big sparse system. So, so I think I mean I would say we're right on the kind of the cusp of people starting to be able to really use these systems and sort of fundamentally explore and develop the algorithms both for sparse training as well as understand the sort of where the breakpoints are. I mean, it may be that we discover actually, no, no, 16 by 16 is too big. What we really want is a four by four, or we want an eight by eight. And, or we, we actually need, we're going to need a 16 by 16 works great if you're doing GP3 and you've got really big matrices, but it doesn't work so well if you're doing BERT and you've got slightly smaller matrices. And so there's a, a sort of a trade off in terms of relationship versus the hidden size. Or something like that. So um, I, I think we don't know. That's what's kind of so exciting at the moment is that there is some really sort of new ground. And, and I would say the one thing that, that, attracted me to this space was a growing clearly and really interesting field but also virtually i wouldn't say completely greenfield but there's so much that we don't know i mean the evolution over the past five years has been astonishingly fast and and it, it's been really exciting to be part of can i just you know i'm trying to picture this and and you know I, i'm not an expert at all on, on this space but like does sparsity help with something simple, like for example, a convolution, like I'm trying to picture what even a sparse convolution would mean. Does it mean like, so, like a lot of the parameters are zero and then my input data is certainly probably not going to be sparse. Right. So the, so the stuff I, I that's going to pass through it, is it dense, possibly right? doesn't make sense to think of it in a, in a convolution, or, although you could clearly maybe have a, a larger. So typically in a convolution, you have a, a small mass that you're, you're mm -hmm. moving across your image. You could potentially think about having a slightly bigger mask that had some holes in it. That that would be an interesting sparse pattern. And, and we we've gone to small masks, I think, because well, partly they give you a nice characteristic in that they they allow you to apply the same kind of transformation everywhere. And and we seem to have standardized around three by three in a lot of places, whereas some of the early CNNs were, were playing around with bigger masks and seeing where the sweet spot was. But I, I don't know. I so I don't know whether the standardization around three by three was a performance as in the accuracy of the model you were making, whether it was a computational compromise in that it was a lot cheaper and it didn't cost you that much in terms of accuracy, but whether the, actually there's a better sweet spot with a bigger sparse mark. I, I mean, it does feel like there's some intuition that, like, for example, if you're imagining images, like pixels close to each other would, would be more relevant to each other than... Yeah, I, and I think that that's certainly... And, and you, you would be picking up the, the kind of sort of edges and those kind of things if you're thinking about actually sort of going through an image processing process that I think there is some logic there. So I, in, in the in the image context, I'm I'm not actually very sure where where how we might be able to use this other than it's a new toy. I'm sure somebody's going to go and play and, and find somewhere where it's interesting. I think the the area that we're seeing probably the most interest is is in the places where you're currently using sort of fully connected layers and you don't want to have to keep paying the cost of having a fully connected layer. And so sort of a stacking multiple partially connected layers together looks like quite an interesting approach and an area that we know. And I mean, you see this with CNNs as well. You can prune CNNs really quite heavily after you've trained them and still maintain fast performance. So can we train those fully pruned CNNs? Can we train these fully pruned language models from scratch in a faster, more efficient way? So can we rig the lottery and find that lottery ticket within within that large dense model by a training process rather than doing that from scratch. And if we could do that and it's efficient, then we might be able to access an even bigger model because one of the things that limits my ability to train a model is do I want to spend a month waiting for it to train? Probably not because I'm going to have to do this 50 times knowing the ML cycles we go through. If I could do that in a tenth of the time or, or even half the time, a quarter of the time, it maybe gives me access to something that's four times as big. And, and it might be better. And so that's the other interesting thing is if we want to keep going up the curve um, of, of model size and try and drive the accuracy higher, having something that, that gives us more flexibility, it's another lever that we can pull in the or a tool in the toolbox for, for exploring this, this, this space. So I could see how at inference time, a sparse fully connected layer, you could do like a sparse operation. That, that seems quite clear. But the training seems tricky, right? You, if you don't know a priori where the the zeros are and the the non zeros, how how do you figure that out? Do you, is that am I asking a deep question that's hard to answer? Is there 
Can you, do you think you can explain that to uh, well, me? Well, I, I mean, that, that I think is one of the known spaces because people have not explored this. So uh, DeepMind, I think, published a paper called Riggle, and which is, is rigging the lottery. And so, which was a way that they proposed to try and sort of discover the, the, the right sparkle pattern, where you wanted your, your, your parameters to be. And, and so I, I think it's, I mean, we, we train these systems through an iterative search effectively where we're, we're, we're learning the parameters. It's another parameter you learn, it's the sparkly pattern. So, so you'll be adding parameters in, you'll be taking parameters in elsewhere. You might have information in the backwards part about where, I mean, so, so one thing you have to be careful of is you probably don't want to calculate the full set of gradients for that, the, the dense equivalent space, because, well, depends what you're targeting. But if you're targeting something that is very big, that could get very, very expensive. And so you, you might want to, for how you get the signal for where you should be adding and removing parameters, maybe it's something goes to zero and you randomly add it somewhere else. Maybe you're trying to come up with some other other method for adding these in. But I mean, that, that's, I think, one of the things we're going to find out is, can we do this efficiently? I mean, it might not work. You never know. Cool. But, so but is this, we'll is this like the main... Out. The main thrust of kind of GraphCore's point of view on the the hardware that that its sparsity is important, or are there kind of other? Uh, I I think th this is one of the things we're very excited about. Actually, one of the really interesting things right from the start of GraphCore is that founders Simon Knowles and, and Nigel Toon they they didn't set out to oh we're just going to go and solve deep learning at the time as it was described. They they set out to say we want to try and build a computer architecture that's designed for machine learning as a general problem and so what are the kind of computational characteristics of this problem and what do we need to do to solve that and and to an extent take a punt at where they thought it was going to go and they got a few things right i think probably got a few things wrong as well but what we've built is a is, is what's designed as a general purpose architecture for for machine learning and so it is very very good at sensing your algebra and we, we're showing um in the um the benchmark results that um, I believe will be published by the time we go to the world, but we're showing sort of world leading performance with BERT, uh, sort of one of the, the very common NLP systems with some of the CNNs. But we're also showing that that some of the classes of models that are more efficient sort of fundamentally, so efficient net, even in the name, but don't run particularly well on, on a TPU architecture or on a GPU architecture because they break up the sort of the the structures that you work with, that they're, they're finer grained in the group dimension than that. And the other uh, sort of standard CNN architectures are. Those work really well on our hardware. We we have a significantly better advantage, greater advantage with those kinds of architectures than we do with the standard sort of CNNs. And that's really we are sort of pretty good at both of them. Just everyone else is really bad at the, at the kind of more efficient architectures. And, and that's the same kind of thing with these fast models. Is is that fundamentally our architecture is designed to be massively parallel, very fine grained. And so you can map these kind of fast problems onto it very efficiently. And other architectures kind of weren't. They were designed to be kind of very big block bulk structured. And they're trying to bolt some capabilities onto it. But but it, it's just fundamentally architecturally a bit more limited in their in their capabilities. So well, um, so can you explain to me like what why it works better on, for example, BERT? Like I don't think of BERT as a I mean BERT's an embedding, right? And those are sort of they're not really sparse, right? They they're like dense, aren't they? And so what's, well, what's so, going on that it's, it's faster? Well, BERT as a, as a model is, I mean, it has an embedding and then it's got a, a sort of a quite a deep stack of transformer layers. Uh -huh. And and so there, it's just, we are very efficient at doing dense linear algebra. So so we can we can beat the dense systems at doing dense linear algebra. Wait, but the why? Tell, can you explain that to me? Like, oh, so, so, like what, what are you doing? Uh, so fundamentally, well, a, a, it was designed from scratch to target this kind of workload. And we store parameters and activations sort of locally, actually within the physical chip itself. So, so the, one of the unique things about the IPU is it, it's a massively parallel architecture. It has about 1,000 IPU cores per IPU. But each of those cores also embeds a very significant amount of memory. So we have about 900 megabytes of memory on each IPU. And then we sort of gang multiple IPUs together into, into larger systems. So and, these are like registers, I guess? So you have like giant registers? Well, it's it's not really registers. It's just kind of a very fast local working scratch. You might think about it like an L1 cache, but it but it's not a cache because it doesn't really cache anything. So it's it's the memory that we work with. So and I feel so like what you're describing though is is like in my dumb 
like my my ignorant <laughs> brain. That's sort of like how I would sort of describe what a, a GPU is doing, right? So what's what's the difference here? It's like a more extreme version of that, or well, so so a GPU has its primary memory system is HBM, and so it's external to the chip. I mean, it's packaged in a kind of a three D package, but they are literally they are stacks of memory that are glued onto a uh, onto a silicon wafer next to the chip. And so uh -huh. it's it's not in the main silicon entity right next to it. You have to go five millimeters through another silicon wafer and back up into a stack of memory. And and that five millimeters means that they can only get only um, about a terabyte a second of memory bandwidth out of their memory system, something like that. Maybe it's a one and a half from some of the, um, the A100s, I think. So um, whereas we get about 50 terabytes a second in and out of our memory systems um, on one IPU, and, and actually from a power perspective, we probably get about two IPUs for one of theirs, maybe, maybe a bit more. So, so the amount of memory bandwidth we can actually deliver is sort of an order of magnitude, two orders of magnitude bigger in these systems. And, th and that makes it really good at dense linear algebra because we can move data back and forward. Actually, I mean, dense linear algebra is a bit more limited by the core computational unit than the memory system. But a lot of our advantage comes with systems that are not quite as dense as the pure dense linear algebra systems or the bits that kind of go around it. And, and so sparse systems, some of these other kinds of flavors are, are, that's where we really, really step out. So we're better on BERT, but we're, we're a lot better in some of these other places. So it's, it, I mean, I, I said this to a, an American who didn't really understand me when I said it was kind of like jam today and jam tomorrow. So, so we're really good today. And then you also get some great things to come tomorrow as well, when we start to actually be able to exploit these new kinds of, of applications. And is there any like, trade-offs to your approach or some different way i mean i'm assuming like you know with tpus google was was imagining a fairly similar workload right i mean this was like machine learning inspired so is there some fundamental decisions that that you made differently here and yes. is there any kind of trade-offs where you know your chip might be harder to use or, or worse in some scenarios so the interesting thing about the tpu is actually sort of from a genesis and idea they the architectures kind of came up about the same kind of time and and the TPU went very, very big from a functional unit perspective. They said, oh, we're going to do really big functional units. And that makes life really easy for the compiler developer. It makes life, from a, from a software perspective, it, it makes it a lot easier to target. But it means they really struggle with anything that's not a big, big map model. Because their, their only big functional unit is a very big map model. Whereas we've got a lot more flexibility with being able to handle smaller and more finer grained workloads. So, um, so they're... they're sort of inspired, we want to target machine learning, but the, the observation that they took was, okay, well, that means we need to be really good at big map model. And, and the observation we took was, okay, well, that means we need to be good at dense linear algebra, but we also want to have all of this other flexibility. And then, so I would say, if there's a downside of our architecture, it's that it makes the work of our compiler and library team quite a lot harder. So they've had to work to build the, the library and the software ecosystem to allow us to attach directly into the frameworks and, and to provide the kind of lowering from a large scale application workflow. So we write in PyTorch, we write in TensorFlow to, to take that and, and translate that into something that maps onto our massively parallel architecture. And so I, I wouldn't, there's not a massive downside from a user perspective. It's more a bit more of a downside for, for our team. And I think it's taken our team a little bit longer to get that stack up and running. But what we do see quite interestingly with this stack is that we get kind of very predictable performance across different architectures, across different um, frameworks, and, and actually between inference and, and training. And so whereas for some architectures, you might have to, um, say, go through a dedicated inference backend to get great performance. And for us, we just, we just take TensorFlow, we take PyTorch, and we just compile, sort of run from the framework, and we get absolute tip-top performance straight out of it. We put all of the work into the front-end framework and making, trying to make it as fast as possible. You know, I guess it's funny. There's this thing that always makes me feel like I um, wasted my computer science education or something, you know, because I, I use typically NVIDIA chips. And so I upgrade the Kudanen library, which I think is kind of similar to what you're talking about. And I mean, I feel like sometimes it'll give me like a 30% speed increase. And I, I just feel like this deep, mystery of like like what happened right it's like the, the hardware is the same conceptually it seems like a fairly simple problem like how could you get such a massive increase with a like a smarter 
compiler. I, I guess that's kind of what, what some of the stuff you work on. Can you sort of like talk about like why this is this kind of conceptually simple thing is like so complicated to get right and, and why we can kind of continuously improve our compilers to make these things run faster? If compiler is even the right word here, the, the um, translation from a network well, to like a hardware. Yeah, um, I mean, I think compiler is the right word. And, and our kind of stack is probably about three compilers stacked or maybe more than that. <laughs> So I think I think the challenge is that these these are ooh now if if I was a computer scientist sorry I think that these kind of compiler transformations are an NP hard problem I think but I might be wrong so but I I think that's why is that actually solving these these kind of systems is quite difficult and so the compilers are typically developed to be quite general or ideally you want a compiler that is you can feed it anything and it will give you something that works and then but but it won't give you something that's 100 percent optimal in every domain because that's a very very tough problem to solve and so as you find new sort of applications and architectures then you might put a bit of work into trying to optimize the performance of those and so sometimes what you're seeing is that the software engineers will have found uh, or have come up with a, a different way of laying out the data sets or a different Sometimes these might be fundamental sort of architectural innovations in that they change the behavior of system. So the, the, that, that, I think, is what you're observing here is, is that the GPUs have a, a very different execution model. And so sometimes they, when they're fusing and doing some kind of transformations, they can actually, um, that, that helps them in some particular areas. So um, they're, and, and, and they're, well, I, I don't really know too much about the, the development details of, of those kinds of platforms. But, but for us, I mean, one of the things I think we've observed is that, A, I think we've still got quite a lot of headroom. So one of the other things that I'm excited about is that we are quite young in our development process of the libraries and the software. And I think we've got quite a lot of performance headroom. So I, I, there are some numbers that I've done on the back of the envelope. And, and I know how fast the chip can go. The chip can go at 250 teraflops and, and it can get very close to that sort of sustaining linear algebra. And I know that some things I put through it don't go that fast. And so, and they probably should go faster than they're going at the moment. So, so that gives me quite a lot of hope, actually, that even the things that we're talking about at the moment have quite a lot of potential. And, and that's really the, the compiler we have is doing a pretty good job, but it's not doing a perfect job. And, and if we go and make it better, it will give us a, a, a better set of performance. And so, I mean, that, that's work. And actually, the, I mean, some of the people that are doing this work are... are I mean, exceptionally capable engineers. And so it's, it's just a case of giving them enough time and space to, to, to do some of this. And so is your, uh, are your chips commercially available? Could I, could I buy one and try it out? Uh, yes, absolutely. No, and actually we're have just, or are, are just about to launch the, the second generation of our processors. So we actually launched the, the first generation a year ago, I believe. And they, they've been adopted and deployed into, into Microsoft Azure. And so we're really excited, actually, about the, the second generation of our product that it, that's being, will be, when we announced this, I think, a, a month or two ago, is, is, is coming very soon. And is, so, I mean, the, the interesting thing is we've slightly changed the form factor that we're deploying these. We used to build sort of things that looked a bit like a GPU, a, a PCIe card. We've actually moved to a, a kind of a, a slightly more integrated form factor that has four of our IPUs in looks a bit more like kind of a one new pizza box sort of server um, and, and is designed explicitly to scale. And so, so we're, we've moved from kind of thinking about systems that are sort of server based with a host processor and, 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 and a set of sort of accelerator cards to a system that's designed to be able to kind of just wrap multiple of these IPU um, machines together and, and cable them with an interconnect and you have a host remote across the network. And, and so disaggregate that that host from IPU processing, but also scale IPU. So we can go from sort of one to 64 out to thousands of IPUs in a, in a very tightly integrated. So yeah, we're, we're, we're really excited about this. And, and actually the performance, the scalability, uh, all of the kind of aspects of, of, of this as a technology are, are, are really interesting. And, and we're, we're talking about some classes of models, BERT, sort of um, ResNet, we've talked about some of these kind of CNNs. Actually, these are all, I mean, BERT's fairly big today, sort of a couple of hundred million parameters, but it's nowhere near the really, really big models that people are working with. So, so I think that's some of the things that we're, we're really interested in is being able to drive the scale of these kind of training systems, but also try and do it more efficiently. And so we give people the tools to, 
to train large systems or train systems to, to high levels of accuracy without needing to, to go all the way into that, that completely dense limit. Do you worry about some of the things that have kind of been in the zeitgeist lately around models getting bigger and bigger, like, you know, only the biggest companies having access to, to be able to train them or like carbon footprint? Like, is that a real effect? I imagine it might actually help you, but maybe bad um, for society. Uh, so uh, the societal sort of impacts of access to this technology are a, are a fascinating topic. I'm, I, I'm probably not one for, for this, because I suspect we could spend another hour on that alone. We're really focused around trying to make this kind of technology uh, available to as many people as possible and also as efficient as possible. And so I think the, the, the way that we'll lower the bar for, for access to this kind of thing is by enabling people to run models that, that are more efficient and enabling them to, to work with architectures that don't require a billion dollars of compute to, to train the model. I mean, the big challenge around that is always going to be access to the data. Because I mean, the one thing we, I'm a compute person, I think about the compute. We also, to a certain extent, have to think about the data and, and, and access to that. And, and really that's the bit that, that seems to be favoring some of the very large organizations today is just that they have the ability to, to pull together the training sets that, that most people don't have access to. So there are two sides to the kind of the access to this kind of technology story that, that I think are. What about energy issues? Do you think that over time, these kinds of chips will become a significant user of, of energy? I, I'm not convinced compared to the, the rest of the fleet of kind of web service infrastructure in the world that, that ML is ever going to get to the scale where it's more expensive than they are. So I, I, mean, didn't, I think it, didn't Google say that some huge fraction of their compute centers was was doing inference? I, 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 if if they have, I've missed it. So um, oh, that, that, could be wrong. that would be an interesting observation. That. So I mean, it, it it's not going to be zero. And so uh, it, it the question I think is whether how much of a percentage of that it is, and 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 also how much of it is going to be sort of training versus inference. I mean, I, I guess if they're doing if they're driving their search backend via inference, and if they're driving all of the backends, sort of Google Photos and YouTube and, and all of those kinds of things. And certainly they are, actually, right? I think. Well, I think yes. I guess, <laughs> so, so you should so probably follow down that. You know, it, maybe it is. But it, it's, yeah. So I, I think, yeah, you could be right. The, the inference workload could look quite large. But again, I think that's probably an area where you would be looking to deploy dedicated chips. And this is why people build dedicated chips is because they're more efficient than the general purpose chips. And so the whole idea of trying to do this is to make something that is more cost effective. So it costs less in, in terms of dollars per model trained or dollars per um, inference served to your customer. And, and part of that's the power cost, part of that's the procurement cost of these kind of things. And so, so I think that kind of comes into the package. That's why we build these kind of special purpose architectures or at least specialized architectures. And I mean, the other comment is with the end slowing down of Moore's law, so very significant plateau in, in the rate of improvement or the, the shrink and also the energy efficiency. We can no longer kind of rely on things just getting better. Sort of every two or three years, we'll get another 50% sort of 2x energy efficiency, whatever the the scaling is, that's kind of really slowing down. And so the specialization of the processes is being driven by that. So we need an architecture that is more memory efficient. And, it, and if you go back to the kind of fundamental processor, we don't move data very far. So the whole architecture is geared around data staying local to the processing entities. And, and the physics of moving data is one of the things that really drives power consumption. So there's, there's kind of doing the actual operation so driving the um, the computational units and and then there's moving data to and from your memory subsystem so if your memory is very close the cost of moving data there is a lot lower energy cost compared to if, uh, if it's off chip the um, the cost tends to be a lot higher and, and this kind of goes into the power consumption of the device where are you spending your power consumption? and so that's kind of one of the premises actually of the ipu is fundamentally more efficient higher floating point operations watts of energy input because we don't move data as far. We try and keep everything as local as possible for as long as possible. I guess one more question on chips, just the, the timing. You know, Apple recently came out with a new M1 that a lot of folks are, are talking about that included some ML-focused stuff. Do you have any opinion on that? It's 
well, a, a really interesting bit of tech. So, and they showed some quite interesting kind of overall sort of performance improvements. I mean, I think this is an example of, of specialization going out into all of these kind of systems. And I think it's also an example of the spread of, of machine learning and as a workload out into all of these kind of systems. So I'm not sure in the context of graph core and, and building sort of data center scale training and inference systems, it's probably not something that, that is particularly relevant for us in terms of marketplace, but it is interesting to see. I mean, we've seen this with mobile phones as well, with sort of dedicated inference chips being embedded into, I mean, I think all of the ones that I've got kicking around have one of these things in somewhere um, that they're using for photos and, and other kinds of things. So I, I think that's just a kind of, you'd almost expect it because every kind of modern consumer-facing workload has some kind of ML embedded into it. Right. I would guess that most of them do. Well, thanks so much. I mean, this has been super fun. I feel like even if it wasn't being recorded, I've learned a lot. <laughs> I'd love it. So we always end with two questions. I mean, I'd love to to ask you these. So the, the first is pretty open-ended. Well, they're both open-ended, but the first one is also open-ended. So the question is, what is kind of one underrated aspect of machine learning that you think people should pay more attention to than they do? So machine learning is a bit of a sort of a chicken and, and an egg in, in that because it's built around processing very large volumes of data, that requires quite a lot of compute, the kind of bar to actually, to get to a kind of a, a, a state of the art solution is quite high, just in terms of the amount of work you have to do from a computational perspective. And so you have to have any kind of data processing algorithm has to be quite efficient um, and be able to run at, at teraflops, tens of teraflops to be able to chew through that. And so either something that's much more sort of data efficient in the way it learns potentially, or something that, that we can find new computational architectures that give us the efficiency on new classes of models. I think those are the things that might be really interesting. Cool. I have to say, it's funny. We've had a bunch of computational chemists talk to us on the show and also in just sort of customer interviews, and they're all talking about graph-based networks. It seems like that might be an area where there's there's a lot of interest. So I, in one of the ones that, that we've been working on, and I'm not sure when we're when we're going to be able to, to publish it, but but is actually a, a graph-based neural network using the spectral library in TensorFlow, which is and, and it's it's a very small example. It's not anything sort of fancy or um, or groundbreaking, but it, it's just an example, I think, of doing a molecular binding prediction using um, using that kind of approach. Cool. Well, you know, the final question we always ask is kind of what's the biggest challenge of making machine learning models work in the real world? But I'm kind of tempted to modify it for you. It's, I'm wondering what's the biggest challenge of um, taking a new piece of hardware to market? It seems like there must be challenges everywhere. But uh, yeah, what's, where's I mean, maybe so, the so I would challenges? like to answer the first one as well. Oh, because please, yeah, one answer of, both. Well, one of the things that we've done quite a lot of, I mean, so we've talked a lot about performance, sort of. How fast does it go? And, and actually, performance is a beautifully simple thing because it's very easy to measure. What's the images a second? What's the sequences a second? How fast does it go? But the, the other bit of that is actually you don't just care about how fast it goes. You care about it giving you the right answer as well. And so you care about your system converging. One of the things that we've been really interested in exploring, actually part of the reason that, that we're, we're working with, with weights and biases, is as part of these kind of building very large convergence systems, sort of leveraging and, and, and doing all of those kind of experiments. So finding the right kind of batch size that gives you the optimal performance with not, whilst not impacting your kind of convergence scheme. So and that, that's one thing that we've been working with. We've had quite a lot of fun, I think, with the numerical behavior in some of these systems, which particularly, so we talk about low precision, good, goes much faster. Also dangerous because you need to manage the precision a little bit more actively than you might do in, in some other kinds of systems. So building a system that is both computationally gives you great performance and also gives you the right answer. I think that's that's kind of one of the things that, that we found sort of interesting as we kind of bring these systems up. And, and mm -hmm. particularly, I would say that the first generations of our systems, um, we had some really interesting sort of convergence schemes running very, very low batch sizes, showing actually extremely rapid convergence, uh, even on, on some big models. And, and they, they were really good. The one thing that we observed today, looking at our large scale systems, is that they wouldn't scale. You can't, they didn't have enough batch size to be able to scale to, to a very large system. So, and we're actually kind of reworking some of the systems we work with to, to support much larger batch sizes. So looking at, at optimizers, we would be using HDD or HDDM quite a lot, um, HDD Momentum quite a lot. We're looking at sort of LAM, very large scale sort of batch optimizers um, that, that are being used by sort of Google and, and NVIDIA as well for their large scale systems. So, yeah, so that's, 
that's certainly been something that's been a whole bunch of fun. And I would I would say it's been very challenging. I mean, the, the number of hours of compute time that we have been sort of spending, sort of developing these kind of systems, and to a certain extent, finding the bugs in the model sometimes where, oh, we've, we've got the layers wrong, or we've, they, there's something that's just not quite laid out correctly, and that's impacting the convergence of these systems, and we need to go and find that. So there, there are those kind of things. In terms of actually building, sort of bringing the kind of new hardware to market, I, I mean, that, that has been a, a tremendous journey. I mean, it goes all the way from completely new architecture, massive amounts of memory on chip. How do you, at the fundamental silicon level, test that system and make sure you've got um, that your processor actually works so that was an interesting problem that that some of our team had to tackle and and we very successfully worked through how do you take one of those systems and integrate it together into a cluster of 16 ipus a cluster of 64 ipus a cluster of thousand ipus how do you make that kind of system work at that kind of scale how do you take all of the various applications and and map them down to the frameworks how do you support multiple different frameworks efficiently i mean there, there's there's been lots of fun across across all of these spaces. So one of the things I would observe is is sort of building these very large scale training systems is one of the big challenges. I mean, it's one of those kind of really big. It's a bit like building the old supercomputers. It, it's a it, it's the grand challenge problems of our time potentially. So so it's quite interesting to go and try and do that from scratch with a completely new set of architectures. And and actually, I mean. One of the fantastic things about GraphCore is is how quickly we can move through some of these processes. So yeah, it, it's a um, it there have been a lot of challenges through that that phase. I would say we've we've met most of them with great success, which is quite nice. And we're we're at the point where we can now bring this all to, to the world, which is very exciting. That's so exciting. It seems like such a fun job. And congratulations on the the latest benchmark. We'll definitely put a link to that in the in the show notes. Yes, uh, thanks very much. I mean, I mean it, it's been been a lot of work from from quite a large team of people. So, and 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 actually very little from me. So the the, the hardware and the software team at, at GraphCore have been beavering away for a, a long period of time, and they they have all done a, a really great job. Awesome. Thanks for your time. Excellent. Thanks very much, Lucas. Thanks for listening to another episode of Gradient Descent. Doing these interviews are a lot of fun, and it's especially fun for me when I can actually hear from the people that are listening to these episodes. So if you wouldn't mind leaving a comment and telling me what you think or starting a conversation, that would make me inspired to do more of these episodes. And also, if you wouldn't mind liking and subscribing, I'd appreciate that a lot.